presentation of TFNN. The Tom O'Brien Show is produced every business day. Tom takes your phone calls toll-free at 1-877-927-6648. Internationally at 727-873-7618. Let's go to Mike in Southern California. Hey, Mike, what's going on? Hey, Tom, nice to talk to you again. And I have to start out and first tell you, I love this trading room. This thing is great. This app, it works great. And uh, getting all the information, it, you're like instantly there. No delay, nothing. That's I know. Great. I Listen, Thank I you appreciate again. your growling problem with us. Your channel is in my pocket all day long. It's wonderful. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, man. You Thank you. Now, Tom O'Brien. Welcome, folks. This is Jacob Shoup filling in for Tom O'Brien. I don't know if you heard the intro, but that caller, he loves the trading room on discord you guys got to get in all right so the rally continues uh the es i mean this is up insane we're we're really looking for the 4400 level right now um i'm sure we'll probably hit something like that this week something to uh kind of keep an eye on some interesting volume movement right here today uh we were speaking a little about a little bit about gdx up 39 uh, 0.39 the dollar um sitting at 103.63 right now um I want to look at today some of the big gainers. We had Carnival Cruise, right? And these cruise lines got kind of smacked uh, during COVID, right? But I mean, we have about a, almost a 13% increase today on, on massive volume. Uh, they had a pretty good outlook, according to some analysts, um, basically saying that the cruises aren't going anywhere. Uh, I, I wonder if there's some way that they're going to... Now, of course, you know, Gen X and the boomers are really what you want to look at because they have money to spend. Um, but I wonder if there's going to be a way that they can kind of acquire, um, you know, millennials and uh, Gen Z at some point. I don't know many uh, younger folks going on cruises. I'm, I'm sure they're a blast. Um, but regardless, I think there's some positive outlook on uh, their earnings. So we'll see if that follows through. Additionally, we have Oracle uh, running today. Uh, they're up in the AI sweep as well. Oh, they're up 6.2%. Uh, uh, so uh, again some positive outlook on, on their um, earnings. So yeah, some big, some big gainers today. Some uh, kind of interesting news regarding this and, and we'll see how much it actually affects their, their companies. And I'm, I'm sure it will at some point. Uh, Uber is still up today, but Uber and DoorDash, right? So there's a kind of a new law going on in New York City, okay? And it's about imposing a minimum wage for these drivers. I think Dash is down today, but this seems a little bit more company specific. Oh, no, we're up. Okay. We were down earlier today, but um, up 0.43. Uh, anyways, so over the weekend, the uh, NYC mayor, Eric Adams, he declared that beginning July 12th, uh, the city is officially raising the minimum wage for its app-based restaurant delivery workers. And that's obviously Uber Eats, DoorDash, uh, to $17.96 per hour. <laughs> and that's from its current average of $7 per hour. So, I mean, quite a, quite a substantial jump. Um, that number is expected to climb to at least 1996 uh, per hour by 2025. Um, it could be worse for the delivery apps as the 2025 proposed rate is much less than the 2382 per hour the Department of Consumer and Worker Protections has previously proposed. And so it actually seems that this is kind of a, um, there, there was some kind of compromise made between the government and the lobbyists. Uh, certainly the comptroller of NYC had something to say about it. Uh, he believes that the rule doesn't go far enough, uh, saying that the mayor um, acquiesced to the lobbying of DoorDash and Uber and that workers would actually be taking home just twelve sixty nine. You know, uh, regardless of that, this is definitely going to um, increase operation costs uh, for them. I think they have put them over to contract work, but they're still going to have to be paid like employees. Uh, pretty interesting. Also, I, I, you know, if we want to look at kind of, you know, DoorDash in particular, right, it seems like these kind of disparities in uh, prices and movements today is a little bit company specific. Uh, you know, the word on the street from people I understand and I know, um, they are leaving DoorDash. If they've worked for DoorDash, they want to get away from that company. They don't apparently pay them very well, um, comparatively speaking. There's a few other companies that are kind of popping up doing the same thing. And uh, the drivers just simply make more money. Um, 
uh, a lady that I see every day at Publix when I go to get lunch. Um, she does DoorDash as well. Uh, she told me this earlier, um, and I have a few other friends who are kind of uh, following suit. So uh, pretty interesting. We'll see how that goes out. Um, additionally, we have some news with Target. Um, the company has lost $15 billion in market value uh, since the start of a, a boycott that had been going on due to some of the products they were selling. Uh, J.P. Morgan downgraded the stock. Um, so it's quite interesting. Obviously, we had a kind of similar situation go on with uh, Bud Light. Uh, they lost their number one consumed beer. I think they were down 60% in sales over the uh, Memorial Day weekend, which is uh, pretty significant. So we'll, we'll see if this, you know, I... Whether or not you agree with the, with the protests, you know, it's still causing quite a bit of a, um, an impact on this company. Target also suffers from some interesting issues regarding um, retail theft, right? And this is hitting a lot of the major, um, you know, brick and mortar retail uh, places. Um, let's take a look over here. Uh, the retail shoplifting is costing billions. The CEOs worried that they are powerless to stop it. Uh, this is retail executives are sounding the alarm on in-store shoplifting as theft burns a multi-billion dollar hole in their balance sheet. I mean, you had uh, even Walmart moving out of Chicago. I remember a few years back you had, I think Walgreens or CVS was moving out of LA just because of the thefts, uh, excuse me, the losses due to the thefts were just so high. Um, there was a study done, and this was in California, that people responsible for these thefts is only a small amount of people, right? It's, it's a small group. I think it's something of like 200 uh, to, to 500 individuals who are responsible for most of it. So, you know, any kind of crackdown, and if these, you know, cities do get pressured into doing so, if um, more of these, you know, companies leave, um, I, I wouldn't suppose that it'd be that difficult if it's such a small amount of people, right? And, and these people are in the system, so... Uh, regardless, uh, it, it's quite interesting to see such a, a large cut into into the profit, essentially, into revenue. Um, this article saying, uh, as if a possible recession and declining consumer sentiment wasn't enough to worry about, retail executives are struggling uh, with increasing amounts of stock disappearing or shrink in the industry parlance. Uh, the problem was talked about more on retailers' earning calls this quarter uh, than any other quarter on record. That was nearly 200 mentions. Uh, the increased attention is basically due to more large retailers calling out shrink, and, and that's the loss um, from the thefts, as a real problem, impacting both sales and margins. Shrink levels are increasing for almost all retailers. Uh, Relish, this is from Michael Relish, uh, is co-CEO of apparel brand Pacific Sunwear of California Incorporated, and that is PacSun, a uh, big clothes company. Uh, the shoplifting losses are beginning to reach staggering levels Target. Uh, said that loss or stolen inventory will hurt profitability with 500 million. So, you know, not only are they getting boycotted, um, but they're also losing almost half a billion uh, to, to retail theft this year. Obviously, this is something that <laughs> really needs to be addressed. And if I were a shareholder, um, I'd be uh, putting the heat on target. Folks, stay tuned. We'll be right back. We have exciting news, Tigers. This June, Tim Ord of the Ord Oracle will be hosting two webinars, providing insight into his renowned market timing methodologies. On June 8th, Tim will delve into the S&P 500, teaching sentiment indicators, identifying market bottoms and divergence, and so much more. On June 15th, Tim pivots to the gold market, taking a look at cycle analysis, ratio studies, advanced decline indicators, and other important tools for analyzing this sector. Sign up today on TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. Currencies, commodities, and bond markets are as important as ever right now with how they're driving the volatility in equity markets across the globe, which is why it's a great time to try out Teddy Kegstat's Tiger Forex Report. Teddy Kegstat breaks down the Forex markets every Monday using his 30-plus years of experience as a trading veteran of futures, Forex, stocks, and options. Teddy releases his weekly Tiger Forex Report every Monday morning with coverage of all the major currency pairs, including the dollar index, the euro dollar, pound dollar, dollar Swiss, dollar yen as well as many more and he also has weekly coverage of the crude oil market and the 30-year t-bonds as they both influence forex markets tremendously 
When you sign up for the Tiger Forex Report, you also gain instant access to Teddy's 60 minute webinar archive he just hosted Forex Strategies and Fundamentals What is Behind the Tiger Forex Report? For all the details and to start your 30 day Tiger Forex Report subscription today, visit the front page of TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. Are you looking for a way to consistently add winning trades to your portfolio? Tom O'Brien is here to help. Tom O'Brien has been successfully trading markets for over 30 years. A frequent contributor to TD Ameritrade Network and CNBC, Tom O'Brien founded TFNN over 20 years ago to help educate investors just like you. Tom's daily market newsletter, Market Insights, is published every morning when the markets open to give you the competitive informational edge you need to succeed. These newsletters are packed full of Tom's advanced technical analysis and are geared to deliver comprehensive strategies for a successful portfolio. Get Tom O'Brien's newsletter, Market Insights, today and try all of our products and newsletters 30 days risk-free with our money-back guarantee at TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com, educating investors. Call now, toll free at 1-877-927-6648. Internationally at 727-873-7618. All right, welcome back, folks. Yeah, before we just move on from this topic, I just, I want to put this number out here. The National Retail Federation calculated that the lost inventory that cost retailers nearly $94.5 billion, and that's just in 2021. And we have an increase the past two years. And you say, well, how, how do we deal with this, right? You, you, you go to places like Amazon, you buy online, but those products still need to get somewhere, right? Uh, they have these little how do you say little nodes that ship out everything and this is this is from two years excuse me this is from last year january but this is what it looks like in la <laughs> this is insane to me this is what it looks like in la uh, where the amazon trains stop right the, the 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 trains that are carrying amazon products um excuse me the uh trains that are carrying amazon products when the, when they stop this is what happens they they get raided so, I mean, it's like cattle rustling, but less like romantic, I guess. I don't know. I mean, but it's just insane. So there's, there's stuff going on in LA for sure. Um, and I think they got to figure that out. So we'll see. Anyways, some news um, on Lockheed Martin, a lot of interesting stuff going on. They're cracking in a little bit more to chips. they are down a little bit today, but that's all right. Because this business booms. Um, so Lockheed Martin and Global Foundries disclosed a partnership to drive manufacturing and innovation of semiconductors and boost domestic uh, supply chains for the U.S. national security systems. Both companies will build a chiplet ecosystem to produce chips rapidly and affordably, uh, supporting the Chips and Science Act's goals of enhancing critical semiconductor technologies. Um, so this is huge for them. Let's look at GFS real quick. And these guys get deals like you wouldn't believe. So this is up, you know, almost 5% today with that kind of news. So interesting, you know, Lockheed Martin has a huge uh, price already, uh, kind of hard to get in. Maybe GFS is a nice way to get some exposure on something like that. Um, let me look at it on today. Yeah, so they liked it. They liked it quite a bit, up almost 5%. Um, dealing more with Lockheed Martin, this is, this is from May 
Um, but it's important to kind of, I, I think, reinforce just how strong this company is. Uh, they won the $751 million contract uh, to support a missile program. Uh, valued at $750.6 million, the contract is projected to be completed by August 18, 2027. Uh, per the terms of the deal, uh, Lockheed will supply JASMs, JASMs, along with containers, tooling and test equipment, and spares to support the missile program. They're getting big, big money. Uh, the future integration efforts will focus on the U.S. and international versions of Lockheed's F-35 Lightning II fighter aircraft. Pretty neat aircraft if you watch some videos on it. And uh, other international platforms. This indicates a strong demand that the missile enjoys in the domestic as well as the international defense space. Uh, on that note as well, the U.S. is announcing a new 2.1 billion weapons package for the Ukraine. And no doubt... Uh, Lockheed Martin, I mean, obviously they benefited already, but it just shows you that um, uh, Ukraine is willing to borrow more and the U.S. is willing to send more, you know, going out into the future on this. Uh, so that's uh, the Department of Defense announced on Friday that it will purchase 2.1 billions in weapons for the Ukraine, uh, including munitions for the Patriot and Hawk air defense systems. Uh, the weapons are being purchased for Kiev under the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative, um, the administration was uh, primarily had relied on the presidential drawdown authority to ship arms directly from U.S. stockpiles to Ukraine. Uh, weapons provided under the USAI could take months or years to deliver as they involve contracts and might need to be manufactured. Just a little look on this more. A Pentagon fact sheet claims that the U.S. is now committed to Ukraine $39.7 billion in security assistance alone. However, a February report published uh, by the Keele Institute said American military uh, spending has already topped 45 billion. So there's a lot of money to be made. And again, as more conversation goes on around uh, some conflict, you know, we there was some in Sudan earlier uh, this, I think last month actually, um, and then uh, heated kind of uh, tensions between the U.S. and China. Um, you know, these security stocks are a great place uh, to fly to, just because they stay stable, huh? It just it they they, I mean, Lockheed. Let me look at a year to date. I think its highest was like five, maybe it's 508. So we're down a little bit, but yeah, these, these stocks continue to do well. I think Raytheon, let me see what that's trading at right now. It was in its 90s for a while. Yes, yeah, still, still there. Oh, we had a nice boost up to 108. So there's some definitely some, uh, some trading going on with these guys currently as well. So interesting nonetheless. Microsoft is trying to purchase Activision Blizzard. And so Activision Blizzard, it's, its main way it makes money, and, it, and this is with, you know, every other large, what they call AAA game developers, is they do the microtransactions, okay? So you're playing the game, and, you know, you don't want to spend all the time leveling or, or whatever, right? And so you can go ahead and use real-world money in order to get, um, you know, boosts in the game, or if you want your, you know, whatever character to look nice. Regardless, it's, it's a massive industry, okay? Microsoft has uh, Xbox, and so... You know, the name of the game in this business is, is you buy um, titles, essentially, right? So uh, the biggest competitors are going to be uh, Microsoft's Xbox um, and uh, PlayStation. And so you want the new games to be developed to only be on one platform or the other, and this is how they stay competitive, and they can charge inordinate amounts of money for it. Um, there's always a big protest regarding it, but uh, it still works. So people don't stop spending the money, so the practices continue. Anyway, uh, the FTC has already sued to block the $68.7 billion, uh, $68 billion acquisition, uh, choosing to bring the case before its internal administrative law judge. I know the UK also, this was months ago I was bringing this up, the UK had blocked it as well, and I was curious to see if the uh, US would do it, and, and they did. So they're set to file uh, for an injunction seeking to block Microsoft's proposed acquisition. Um, by filing for the injunction, the FTC is seeking to stop the acquisition before the deal's July 18th deadline. Pretty insane. Um, and it just seems like th this, is, <laughs> this is like cost of doing business for a lot of these large uh, companies. I, I think Google's facing an antitrust issue now with how they handle some data. Um, Meta always does this. I, I'm sure you just write it in at this point. Um, but Microsoft is facing it now as well. 
And so we'll see what happens. Um, if they acquire Activision, Activision Blizzard has tons of titles. Um, so Microsoft will now have kind of the monopoly on that. And they stand to uh, make quite a bit of money from it. Um, and these tech entertainment systems, like even when you're facing like recessionary periods, uh, people still continue to buy them. I mean, it, it's almost become like a cultural thing. I, I don't uh, play video games anymore, but when I was young, that was what happened, right? So like every Christmas, they, they plan the release this way. Every beginning of summer, <laughs> you know, break. Uh, when you were like in middle school, they planned it. And, um, you know, even people into adulthood still kind of hold on to that and it's become a cultural thing. And so the, the video game industry continues to make tons of money, even if uh, their, their practices are a little strange. Folks, stay tuned, we'll be right back. The Gold Report. As a precious metal, gold is still king. It continues to hold the most effective safe haven and hedging properties across the global major trading hubs of the London OTC market, the U.S. futures market, and the Shanghai Gold Exchange. The Gold Report. Tom O'Brien publishes his weekly Gold Report every Monday morning for subscribers, consisting of coverage of the XAU, HUI, GDX, the dollar, bonds, the South African RAND, as well as 25 different mining equities with specific buy-sell recommendations. The Gold Report. New subscribers get a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. Subscribe to Tom O'Brien's Gold Report newsletter now at TFNN.com. Sharpening your skills as an investor is like getting better at playing a musical instrument. You have to practice, sure, but you also need excellent instruction from experts. At TFNN, you'll get advice and guidance from the authority in technical market analysis. And it's not just dry, tedious text either. TFNN airs live financial content streamed live on TFNN.com and TFNN's YouTube channel with Tiger TV. Live every market day from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern for free. Each host is an experienced trader and gives their take on the market while taking calls and questions live from around the world. From the moment the market opens until the closing bell sounds, Tiger TV has eight different shows with expert hosts to help you make the right moves with your money. Watch online at TFNN.com or on TFNN's YouTube channel and become the investor you were born to be. TFNN, educating investors. TFNN has just launched their new trading room, The Tiger's Den. Hosted at Discord, TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. And now they are expanding their reach with The Tiger's Den. Available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no cash or added costs when you join our community of traders. In The Tiger's Den, you can look over the shoulders of Tom O'Brien and the other TFNN hosts while they analyze charts during their live Tiger TV programs and join an interactive trading community with hundreds of members exchanging ideas. Interact with other Tigers and Tigresses as they share trading ideas, news analysis, and discuss the market action all trading day, even at night and on the weekends. The Tiger's Den at Discord is accessible on mobile or tablets as well, so it's always at your reach. To sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders, just visit the front page of TFM. This segment is brought to you by Think or Swim. For more information, just click the Think or Swim banner on the front page of TFNN.com. All right, welcome back, folks. Uh, some quick news before we get into a story I want to talk about. Uh, we have NASDAQ buy Adenza for $10.5 billion, and that's like a risk data company. Uh, and the U.S. exchange operator's biggest deal uh, so NASDAQ is acquiring a financial risk software company, Adenza, for $10.5 billion and its larger ever, largest ever acquisition as the world's big exchange operators diversify from transactions into more stable revenue streams like data, risk, and management. Uh, the cash and stock acquisition, acquisition is expected to, quote, significantly enhance NASDAQ's offerings in regulatory technology, compliance, and risk management. Uh, this is an exceptional opportunity. This is NASDAQ chief speaking. 
to acquire a leading software company. So yeah, I mean, pretty huge acquisition. Denza, which is owned by a private equity firm, Toma Bravo, is expected to generate 590 million in revenue and 300 million in free cash flow this year. Pretty nuts. Uh, some other quick news, Argentina is <laughs> turning again to the IMF in a last ditch bid to stave off devaluation. Inflation in the South American nation is expected to reach 145% this year, uh, and a recession is looming, and the central bank's net reserves of hard currency are negligible. Uh, the Argentinian peso, the Argentine peso, uh, has fallen almost 40% against the U.S. dollar uh, <laughs> on the black market this year. That's good. Um, Peronist government is striving to avoid a big devaluation. Yeah, well, uh, or a lapse into hyperinflation. How could you not be there already? Um, I, I think, like, it was in the 90s, right? Something like, really like Pete Singer or something like that? He, uh, anyways, they, they, they went into a huge amount of debt to the IMF, and that's just a bad spot to be in as a country regarding, like, sovereignty, right? So it's, it's kind of insane to see. We'll see what happens with that. Um, and then the EU um, is offering to, uh, Tunisia over a billion dollars uh, to stem migration. Uh, Brussels proposes $255 million in grants for Tunis, uh, linking longer-term loans of up to $900 million to uh, reforms. The financial assistance package was announced on Sunday in Tunis after Ursula von der Leyen, uh, that's uh, Germany's, I think that's her, the EU representative for Germany, um, accompanied by the prime ministers of Italy and the Netherlands, um, spoke with the Tunisian president. Yeah, so, so basically um, all the uh, migrants... Uh, flood through um, either Libya or Tunisia, and it's starting to weigh a little bit on the EU um, kind of system. So they're now going to just pay Tunisia to stop doing it. I know that's also an issue with Turkey as well, and they've been trying to figure out ways that they can meet halfway uh, to kind of stem the flow of migration. It, it seemed like it was going to be a positive back in 2016. You know, you had a declining population, um, and in order to kind of fund the pensions and, and uh keep cheaper products and all that, that kind of stuff. Uh, they were accepting migrants, but now there's just so many and it's um, really affecting the systems over there. I know the UK suffers quite a bit from this. Um, and the idea essentially is not, you know, paying it off like some kind of ransom, but what it is is, you know, Tunisia is uh, suffering a little bit, um, economically speaking. So these kind of, this kind of money um, will hopefully prevent people from feeling like they need to flee their country um, into the EU for uh, better economic uh, kind of futures. So, the story I wanted to talk about, and this is about California's $100 billion electric bullet train. Uh, so that's going to be fully solar powered. And the reason I want to, that I thought this was interesting, right, is you, you have these fires coming out of Canada, and it is cutting energy production uh, of solar panels by like 50%. Uh, it's, it's pretty intense. And this is why I've always kind of, promoted having a, a larger, excuse me, a more diverse um, energy portfolio, right? And it seems, you know, I, I, I think regulators and, and legislators are a little slow to the game. Um, so, you know, they're on solar now, and, and maybe there's a lot of, I would suppose, probably government incentive to keep on that and, and not shift the way or at least diversify. Um, but we, we can see now that just relying on something solar powered um, has its drawbacks, right? And so obviously that's affecting things up in New England, uh, this 50% cut. Uh, California deals with wildfires like nobody else. And so it'll be, uh, you know, I, I think there's something they kind of need to think through on this. But regardless, um, let's crack into this a little bit because I think it's just kind of interesting and it's kind of a push forward in some capacity. Um, so this is just kind of talking about a little bit of the history of it. Obviously, Elon Musk got a lot of hype on the Hyperloop. Uh, so let's talk about the actual high-speed rail. Um, so the California High-Speed Rail Authority is preparing to begin discussions with potential suppliers of a $200 million utility-scale system that it will own and operate. Uh, it'll include 552 acres of solar panels. That is an, an immense amount of land uh, generating 44 megawatts of electricity. Uh, enough for a city of 33,000 people, uh, and batteries to store 62 megawatt hours of power. The system must be robust enough uh, to provide powerful electrical bursts to propel trains at up to 220 miles uh, per through the 171 miles Central Valley segment of railway. That would be nuts to ride onto. 
Um, let's see here. Uh, withstand intense heat and keep passengers moving along, even if there's a blackout at local utilities. That's significant as well, right? Because they have, they have some energy strains in California too. Uh, work could begin by 2026 to ensure it's ready to power trains by 2030. Uh, the target opening date for the railway's initial segment, uh, Margaret Sederith, uh, told authorities uh, director of planning and sustainability. Excuse me, she is the authorities director of planning and sustainability and she told this to Forbes. Um, little plug for the state of California. We were talking about them just earlier in the show. And that's, that's another thing to look at too, right? Like this is a relatively like progressive thing to do. Um, in a lot of ways, it's, you know, positive having high speed rails and, and doing it, you know, quote unquote, in a, in a green manner, um, you know, is viewed positively. Uh, but they also have so many other problems as well. And so, you know, not that they necessarily, I suppose, care too much about public opinion, uh, but there, there's certainly going to be some kind of pushback, at least socially, regarding this, right? So it'll be interesting. Um, the country's most ambitious and expensive infrastructure project uh, with an estimated cost of more than $100 billion. And so this is crazy, too. Okay, so, I mean, new infrastructure is being built. Um, but there's the question now, too, with the collapse of I-95 in Philly. Uh, you know, like, why did that fire collapse that section? And it's, you know, a, a lot of our infrastructure, and again, this isn't being tagged on to, like, the interstate. Um, but, you know, it brings a broader question. Like, how are we going to move forward um, as a country, right? A lot of this stuff was built in the 50s. Um, has it been kept up? I mean, in the case of I-95, probably not. I would also say there's a t much more people now. Um, you know, I worry too with where I'm at in, in St. Pete and Tampa and the kind of Bay Area there. Uh, there are just so many people. And, and does that add to extra stress on um, our overpasses? You know, we have a bridge that crosses the Bay to get into Tampa. Um, what are the effects of that? I mean, that's that's you know, the amount of added people there and, and essentially the vibration from driving, um, it, it's interesting to see if, if infrastructure can actually withstand that for uh, uh, an extended period of time without any kind of like major overhaul um, and investment uh, regarding like repair. And if it's just not worth it, what is the infrastructure of the future uh, regarding transportation? Uh, I think they're building a train uh, here. Um, it's going to, I think it's connecting to Orlando, and that'll be interesting. Florida's unique, too, because it's so hot out, and it's like, where does it drop you? But I still think it's an interesting kind of push forward. Uh, folks, stay tuned. We'll be right back. If you're looking for potential trading setups in the stock market, then Rocket Equities and Options Report is a newsletter you should try. Tommy O'Brien delivers options and equity trades when the markets present them using a combination of fundamentals and technicals. Sign up for Rocket Equities and Options Report today with a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. For all the details and to start your subscription today, visit the front page of TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Biotech is booming, but for how long? Whether you think the biotech bull has room to run or has run its course, trade LABU or LABD. Direction's daily S&P Biotech three times bull and bear ETFs. Visit directioninvestments.com slash biotech today.
An investor should consider the investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses of the direction shares carefully before investing. The prospectus and summary prospectus contain this and other information about direction shares. To obtain a prospectus or summary prospectus, please contact direction shares at 866-476-7523. The prospectus or summary prospectus should be read carefully before investing. An investment in the funds is subject to risk, including the possible loss of principal. The funds are designed to be utilized only by sophisticated investors, such as traders and active investors. Distributor Foresight Fund Services, LLC. We have exciting news, Tigers. This June, Tim Ord of the Ord Oracle will be hosting two webinars, providing insight into his renowned market timing methodologies. On June 8th, Tim will delve into the S&P 500, teaching sentiment indicators, identifying market bottoms and divergence, and so much more. On June 15th, Tim pivots to the gold market, taking a look at cycle analysis, ratio studies, advanced decline indicators, and other important tools for analyzing this sector. Sign up today on TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. This program is brought to you by Vista Gold, traded on the NYSE American and TSX under the symbol VGZ. I'm O'Brien. All right, folks, we're back. Um, some more, some more uh, damning information on on some of the weed stocks. Washington State marijuana farms, uh, they're temporarily shut down uh, because they're using uh, DDT and DDE on their, uh, their cannabis. Um, that's a really bad thing to use in anything that's going for human consumption. I do remember though, my, my granddad was in the military in the 60s and he said DEET was the best thing to ever be created. Um, but the, you know, that kind of, that's a, that's a loaded kind of opinion, especially coming from that era. Um, so some of the two months following the move, the state cannabis regulator said that cannabis licenses are situated in the five mile stretch of land along the south end of the Okanogan River and north of Lake Pateros. And this is so bad environmentally, you know, not to mention people smoking it. And I had some faith, I feel like when they were making this recreational that uh, they, they would have uh, better oversight regarding this. And it, clearly they, they didn't, you know, I guess at least it is illegal for them, but it would be nicer to have some oversight and how many people have been smoking. I mean, it's hard to wash that off. I actually, I have a friend who works for a company. They've created a detergent for weed, um, you know, for, for commercial cannabis. Um, but I, you know, I don't think they were accounting for, for DDT and DDE, uh, when they were, uh, when they were making that. Anyways, earlier I wanted to speak a little bit about, uh, the central banks buying gold. Um, obviously the Western banks had been adding, uh, quite a bit, um, but China has been buying quite a bit. And I, I put a really big emphasis on that one. Uh, China stretches gold buying spree into the seventh straight month in May, and they add, you know, signaling more de uh, central bank de-dollarization. Um, heightened central bank demand for gold has yet to abate as China amassed more of the yellow metal in May. And that's according to Bloomberg. Uh, the country's central bank purchased 16 tons of the reserve commodity last month continuing a trend uh, that started in November. Uh, through the preceding six months, China acquired 144 tons of gold and has now amassed um, 2,092 tons. And my mouse is no longer operational, but just give it a second and we'll keep up. Uh, China is not the only country boosting demand for the precious metal, and really the East loves uh, gold, and they've, they've been a, a major um, driver of that, essentially. Yep, and we have uh, William in, in Boca looking at AMD. William, how are you doing? Are you there? I'm doing fine. How are you? Doing all right, William. So you want to take a look at AMD? Sure do. Yeah, so AMD is, that's, in my uh, like kind of opinion on it, is going to be the competitor for NVIDIA. Um, looking at the chart here on the yield, year to date, you know, May, you had that bump up, and you really kind of had a consolidation around the 120 and moving up, and what are we at today, 128. Um, it didn't get as much exposure or e explosion um, kind of regarding uh, the, the AI boom that's been going on, um, but I think it's starting to get looked at a little bit more. And the reason I say that is because a lot of, you know, um, forums or people online are now kind of questioning why has an AMD um, received the same kind of exposure as NVIDIA? And what it increasingly kind of seems like 
is just that Nvidia had so much hype around it. And the way this market moves a lot is uh, through hype. That's kind of my look on it. I think AMD is poised to benefit a lot more um, from this AI hike, um, but I think a lot of other companies are as well. Um, and they're, they're a pretty solid company. So that's kind of my like cursory analysis on AMD. Um, if you want to call in tomorrow, I can do a bit more of a look into their uh, financials as well and uh, kind of give you some better insight. Um, but yeah, a lot of people are starting to look at AMD um, and a lot of people like it as well. So. Well, I sure like it. Um, I've been writing covered calls on that stock for, I don't know, a year. Oh, right and, on. Um, it sure has made my bank account. Yeah, no good. kidding. You look at the chart from year to date, it's been doing quite well, too. Yep. Yeah, I, listen, yep. I, I think anyone getting kind of into these, into this realm of tech that's going to be used for AI, I mean, they're going to become pretty stable in the economy going forward. I mean, if you were listening earlier, you know, uh, Lockheed Martin's even getting into it, so... Yeah, this is a pretty, I, I, I like everything kind of in this sector, so. Right. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, of course, William. Thank you so much for calling in. Uh -huh. Bye now. All right. Let's see here. Where were we? Talk about China a little bit with gold. Anyways, yeah, the, the East is going to extend, uh, continue to buy gold. Um, we'll see what happens if gold's making a bottom now. But, uh... That is definitely, obviously, a question for Tom in an extreme way. Uh, he is the gold man. Uh, but looking at it, again, GDX, that's at 31.19. The dollar is still sticking up here, and, you know, that kind of depresses the metal equities in some sense. So it seems like copper, though, um, is seeing a huge increase. Uh, this is from mining.com. The copper mining profits top $100 billion a year, but the question is, but where are the new mines? So, uh... Essentially what's going on here, right, copper's exploding in value right now, um, but there aren't new mines opening up. But this is actually positive uh, for the sector as a whole in the sense that they're extending uh, the, ma the mine life quite a bit. Um, expansion capital uh, is focused on the brownfield projects, and with the number of new mines over the last four years adding up to 15 compared to 32 over the same period a decade ago um, when profits were below $60 on a clear downward trend, um, but we've seen an increase in uh, earnings, essentially, for copper. And that's just because they're getting uh, kind of more out of it. Here, let me throw this over for you. So companies have been recently focusing on extending the life of mines, uh, especially of those high-grade ones um, and already profitable projects. Uh, because let's be honest, it takes a lot of time to develop something new and it takes a lot of administrative effort. And also that transition from like exploration and setting everything up um, to profitability, um, you know, can kind of impede uh, earnings a little bit. Uh, it's a very ominous, broader view of the copper supply, and we expect it to be only worsened by sundered major discoveries, uh, tight copper exploration budgets, and of course, time-consuming exploration work. And so it's going to increase the value. Um, but yeah, let's, let me see here real quick. We got SCCO. Not up significantly. By any means, that's a. I was looking at uh, Southern Copper, uh, out in Mexico City there, but no, no major movement on it. Uh, as a result, the S&P Global believes, despite fairly substantial estimated surpluses uh, for the next three years, the copper price will hold up well through 2026 before scaling 10,000 a ton again in 2027 when the market deficits begin to appear. I'll, I'll link this too in the chat, and I'll actually do it right now because I always kind of forget. So there you go. Fletch in the den asking who's making DDT. Yeah, that's a good question. I wonder where I, I probably might be buying it overseas, honestly, right? That stuff stays in the soil forever, too. It's so insane. But uh, yeah. Um, oil forecasts are getting slashed, even with the Saudis trying to stabilize the price of it. Uh, let's see what else. China's NEO is cutting prices because they're not able to compete, and they're also stopping the uh, free battery swapping as sales slide. Um, I think they're cutting their base. I'll get the number for you in a second here. Let's pull up NEO. Is this right here? Folks, stay tuned. When we get back, I'll, I'll pull up the, uh, the right ticker for it. We'll be right back.
Are you looking for a way to consistently add winning trades to your portfolio? Tom O'Brien is here to help. Tom O'Brien has been successfully trading markets for over 30 years. A frequent contributor to TD Ameritrade Network and CNBC, Tom O'Brien founded TFNN over 20 years ago to help educate investors just like you. Tom's daily market newsletter, Market Insights, is published every morning when the markets open to give you the competitive informational edge you need to succeed. These newsletters are packed full of Tom's advanced technical analysis and are geared to deliver comprehensive strategies for a successful portfolio. Get Tom O'Brien's newsletter, Market Insights, today and try all of our products and newsletters 30 days risk-free with our money-back guarantee at TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com. Educating investors. Don't forget, you can listen to TFNN live on your mobile device 24 hours per day. Go to TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. That's TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. Okay, yeah, I had the right ticker, so I don't know what I was thinking. Um, anyways, yeah, so Neo's cutting uh, prices, so that's going to be down about 4200 for all models, including the... Uh, their newer models, the uh, ES6 and ES8. Uh, the company will also no longer provide free battery swapping services to buyers who place deposits on Monday and onwards. It's added. One of the things that was interesting, and I, I was thinking about it a little bit, and uh, was kind of seeing a path forward for, for Tesla to even like maintain dominance outside of like actual EV production, is you know they've been in it for so long, and their cars all collect data, you know, they're mapping how the roads work, they're mapping changes that maybe not aren't uh, reflected in, in other databases. And uh, th that could be pretty integral for autonomous driving. And so if that really is like a, a path forward in the future, um, which I think is currently neglected now just with a conversation about EVs, um, but, but if autonomous driving uh, also becomes larger in the discussion, um, Tesla could easily rent out some of that data uh, for quite a nice uh, penny. You know, so usually at this time also, I would give you some interesting, um, you know, kind of synopsis on a, on a scientific journal or something. Um, but I usually get those and in, in find them, they get compiled on Reddit. Um, but basically Reddit CEO, uh, you know, they, they have data and other apps use that data. Um, and so there's, he's making changes to the API where he's going to start charging for it, the Reddit CEO. Everyone hated this. 
um, and some of the really popular apps that use Reddit data um, won't be able to afford it and will therefore cease to exist. Uh, so you had a bunch of um, what they call subreddits um, basically going dark, right? This was so intense that it actually knocked Reddit offline for about two hours today. Um, the CEO <laughs> went online and said, yeah, well, you know, cry some more about it. We're not changing. And and why would he, right? I mean, this was the response with Netflix and uh, everyone still bought Netflix and they made a bunch more money. Um, and I'm talking about with the, um, you know, account sharing switch they did. Folks, thank you so much uh, for being with me. I'll be here tomorrow um, and possibly the next day and the day after that and then Friday as well. Uh, thank you so much, folks. Have a great rest of your day. Building wealth.